we see as a water agency, as part of our duties with Southern Nevada Water Authority is we provide conservation programs to our member agencies. So this is what we see through our programs. And uh, I'm going to highlight um, the resort hotels. Everybody, um, we get a lot of comments about the resort hotels. They come in, well, you know, gee whiz, all this stuff. You see everything. They've got to be just going through water. And I think you'll be able to see that uh, they're pretty efficient. These, these buildings, these, these structures that they have here are, are very efficient. So I'll go ahead and get started. So this is Southern Nevada. We get 4.2 inches of rain a year. And that's actually come down. It was, <laughs> it was uh, 4.3. And they do a 30-year average, and they were down to 4.2. So far this year, we've had less than, um, I think, less than three-quarters of an inch of rain. And that's the way it is. How many of you guys are from the Midwest and East Coast? <laughs> well, you're going to laugh when I say a humid day here in southern Nevada is about 23% humidity. That's unbearable. It, it is unbearable to me. And you get sweaty. And, well, you guys know how that feels it, <laughs> at 80 or 90%. <laughs> My wife's from Omaha. Uh, you know, we spend time in Omaha at 90, 90. You know, it's miserable. But uh, a humid day here is 23%. And certainly, we can get single-digit uh, humidities here. And so it is indeed a dry heat. And we can see temperatures above 110. Usually, we get a couple of weeks, sometimes three weeks of, uh, you know, 118s, 120s. So, um, it's very, and then in the wintertime, we can get down into the 20s. So it'll freeze dry things. It's very windy, um, a very harsh environment. There's a lot of specialized plants and animals here. Um, and those rain events I spoke about, they come in about 13 separate rain events. So we do have a monsoon season. That's in the fall, late summer, fall. Um, and this winter, it'll rain here too. But we didn't get much rain this winter. So it, uh, it's, it's fairly dry. So why Southern Nevada? We have, actually have 2 million residents that live here. And uh, not all of them live on the Strip or under the casinos. And I had that question. Someone asked me that. I was in Kentucky uh, about three weeks ago. And, they, you know, where do you live? You know, well, we don't live on that two-and-a-half-mile Strip. Um, 36 billion in taxable retail sales, $11 billion in gaming revenue. And we have 154,000 hotel rooms. That's, uh, there's some cities that we could just bring in, whole cities, and give them all a hotel room. Um, and, you know, the stations, casinos, uh, these are local casinos. Uh, that's what they, they cater to is locals. Uh, most, of their, most of their buildings have uh, at least 1,000 rooms. I'm, I think this, this one is a little bit special because of where it is. Uh, the local neighborhoods didn't want a 1,000-room tower, so I think it's under, under 1,000, but it's, it's over 500. Um, we get 39 million visitors a year here. On any given weekend, we could fill the Rolls Bowl with standing room only, or any day for that matter. Every day, we get over 100,000 people that come to visit here. They either drive in from California or come through the airport. So, you know, we're hoping everybody brings a bottle of water. We're, we're trying to get that going. <laughs> so, and did we have a question? Oh, okay. And 933,000 jobs through, through, the, uh, through tourism. That's our biggest industry. Um, and to give you an example, uh, MGM Grand, the green hotel at the end of the strip, the all green, that has 5,050 rooms. It employs a little over 10,000 people just in that building alone. So uh, these hotels, they employ a lot of people. And then that just filters throughout the whole community. Whoop. So. This is Hoover Dam, and I, how, has anyone been out to the Hoover Dam to, uh, this week? Did you see the old bypass bridge? Well, this was taken from the, the bypass bridge. Um, 
but you can see our bathtub ring. Um, that's, that's 120 feet uh, that the waters come down. It also kind of gives you a good idea of what our water quality is like. Some of the chemistry of our water, it's pretty hard. This is actually the lowest the water's been since they filled the lake. So since they started filling. Right now our uh, Lake Mead is at 48% uh, capacity, so it's, it's a little less than half full. And just to give you an idea of how much water that, um, this was taken back in 1983. And I can tell you that that's a pretty spectacular sight. Um, these are the overflows. Let, let me go back. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but here's one here. These are overflows, and the other one, the one you're going to look at is right over here. Um, uh, the water was overflowing. They have gates that come up off these, off these uh, towers. There's a gate that comes up right here. It rolls up. It allows full capacity. This lake, the lake level is at 1229. That's the, the maximum amount of water surface area for Lake Mead. That's 157,000 acres of water. Um, it's uh, 247 square miles. Just to give you an idea, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation manages the Hoover Dam and they manage the lake. They, they're the ones that open all the gates, run everything. Uh, they've done a little uh, math. When the lake goes up a tenth of an inch, it covers two acres of land. Just to give you an idea. So, um, that's a lot of water. And, uh, whoops, I keep pointing that at the wrong thing. So this is what it looks like today. This picture wasn't taken very long ago, about a month ago. Um, if you look at that, the difference between those gates being up and down, it's 1.2 million acre feet of water. So that represents quite a bit of water. Um, so this is the Colorado River Basin, and you'll notice that there's two different colors of the basin. And here's where the history lesson starts, all right? So back in the 20s, um, even before then, they had a couple of hydrologists. These guys were goofing around in Southern California down here. Whoops. Man, I really went. These guys were goofing around. Holy cow. Sorry. All right. Down here is the Imperial Valley in California. Strawberries, vegetables. It's, uh, it's very productive farmland. In fact, if you get uh, strawberries in the winter, that's where they came from. So this is the Imperial Valley. Y you know what? The soil in the Imperial Valley is really rich. It's, uh, it's a great place to grow vegetables, obviously. And guess what? The Colorado River isn't too far away. And they discovered that back in the late 1800s, a couple of guys, and they started selling little five-acre farms down there. And what they did was they dug a bunch of channels from the Colorado River into the Imperial Valley. And what they would do is they'd run their water through the channels. Well, the Colorado River is full of silt. It's, it's the, it's, it, there's a reason it's red. It's full of silt. It goes through the Grand Canyon. You, you all know about that. But, um, and it floods. It floods a lot. Back then it flooded two, three times a year. And so what would happen is their channels would flood, it would flood their farms, fill up with silt, they'd have to clean them out. So they, um, they got a couple of ideas. One, they dug another channel to try to, on the other end of their, their channels, to try to just run everything out and back into the river. Well then that year they had three monster floods on the river. This is the Sea of Cortez down in Southern California. That's Colorado River water. That's from that flood. Their channels broke open. The river almost changed course at that time. Flooded out a bunch of farms. At that time, those farms were very productive as well. And they started complaining to their, their, you know, their congressmen and their senators. And one happened to be Her Hubert, Her Herbert Hoover, right? So he gets together and he says, hey, you know what? Los Angeles is growing. We've got this flooding problem with these farms down in the Imperial Valley. Let's get everybody in the Colorado River Basin together 
and uh, we'll talk about, and we'll build a dam to stop the flooding. We'll sell power to Los Angeles, which is growing, and, every, and we'll pay for the dam. And that's kind of how that all came to pass. So again, this area was kind of the, kind of led the charge. And so um, they got all these states together, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Nevada together. And they, and they started talking about dividing up the river. Well, back then, obviously, the river flow. Yes, sir? Not to change the subject, but who owns the water? The water? Well, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll show you, I'll show you how it's, a, uh, it's broken up. But they got together and they decided, you know what? Hydrologists say there's 15 million acre feet of water coming down the river every year. Let's just split that up. And that's what they did. And um, so the reason there's two colors here is Lee's Ferry is the dividing point for the upper and lower basin. So by law, by federal law, the upper basin is required to deliver 7.5 million acre feet of water to the lower basin every year. And Lake Mead is, is our storage area. Lake Powell is their insurance policy that they can do that. And then they built the Glen Canyon Dam, you know, so they generate power as well. So, but as you can see, oh, let me get to this part. I kind of, but, you know, there's 30 million people that live in this basin area. It irrigates 3 million acres of farmland, and, uh, and that's 70% of the use. So agriculture. Um, I just talked about the allocations or how much water comes down. That's o it, the river is o over allocated. This is the most regulated river in the United, actually in the world. Um, everybody's got their finger in it. And um, like I said, the current storage capacity is less than 50%, and it's 90% of our water source here in southern Nevada. So we've got some challenges. So this is how it was broken up. Those guys got together, and um, obviously Nevada wasn't a very good negotiator. But, <laughs> but to his defense, there, nobody lived here. We don't have agriculture here. Uh, so you know what, 300,000 acre feet, he probably thought that was, wow, yeah, that's a lot. But just to give you an idea, um, Mexico came on board, so it certainly is a, an international treaty now, because Mexico is obviously on the Colorado River. And I will tell you right now, if you go uh, past the Morales Dam on the Colorado River, it stops flowing. There's no more river. So, yeah, I don't know if you've all heard about the pulse flow that they sent down the river just recently to flood the river. That was one of the reasons to try to reestablish some of the delta uh, on the Colorado River. So uh, it, it's tragic, but this, this river is over allocated and every drop of water is used. It used to be a navigable waterway. The Coast Guard used to have a station on, you know, I mean, for crying out loud, you could take a boat. So. But this is how it's broken up. And just to give you an idea, Lake Mead evaporates 800,000 acre feet of water a year. That's a system loss. That's you know, twice, twice what, we, what we use here in southern Nevada. And uh, just so I just need to point that little sliver out, there's Nevada. Um, that's, our, that's our water. So as I mentioned, 90% of our water comes from the Colorado River. 10% uh, from groundwater. We have wells here. We used to have a springs that flowed about 3,500 gallons a minute. Um, those got used up. The Springs Preserve, if you get a chance to go visit that, that's the birthplace of Las Vegas. And you can see the spring houses that they had and, and things like that. So it was really interesting. We are um, working on some other groundwater projects in the northern part of the state and those pipelines and things like that. So. That's in the works to kind of diversify our water portfolio. This is an important concept um, for us. Because of our proximity to the Colorado River, uh, we, get to, we get to use what's, what's called return flow credit. So if we use a gallon of water indoors, we capture it, clean it, 
we can put it back in the lake, we can draw that gallon right back out again. And it doesn't count against our allocation. So we, we have 300,000 acre feet of water allocated to us. We actually use some, there's been times where we use 525,000 acre feet because of return flow credit. We clean the water, we put it into the Las Vegas wash, which is a natural wetland that we've restored and we maintain. And then it polishes it on the way back to Lake Mead. We draw it out again, we clean it, goes back into the system. So indoor water use is very important to us. We want to make sure, you know, a lot of our conservation programs are geared for outdoor water use or consumed water. And you can see there's a reuse section here. And golf courses here in Nevada use reuse water, most of them. There's, there are a very small few that use potable water anymore. And that's because they haven't gotten the pipe up to their doorstep yet. But for the most part, uh, our member agencies will bring the, the purple pipe to your doorstep. You're required to put it in and, and irrigate your golf course with that. And that saves us on pumping costs. It's, it's, we lose that water, but we gain it. It's not used to generate energy to pump water up the hill. Water, to move wa 1,000 gallons here in Las Vegas, it's 6.5 kilowatt hours. So that's kind of a, the, the metric we use to move water. So this is kind of how water is used here in southern Nevada. And this is by our metered customers. And you can see golf courses are 6.5% of the, the use. And, and I, I did a presentation to a group of Syrian land planners one time. And uh, one of the guys asked me, he goes, why do you allow golf courses and uh, things like that, these outdoor recreation things? Said, well, that's part of our economy. You know, we just don't tell people they can't do something. We have car washes. We have swimming pool builders. We, we, we don't want to impact uh, our economy and, and hurt people and, and send people out of jobs. We work with them. They work with us. The golf courses have removed 900 acres of non-playable turf, the turf that's out of play. They've removed the equivalent of about nine golf courses here um, as part of our incentive programs, but they, they do it for conservation. So they've repurposed that water. They're very efficient. Even though they're using re reuse water, they've done that. Resorts, and we'll talk more about resorts, they take 7% of the water. But if you think about some of these big, big resorts, a lot of that water is used indoors, and I'll show you how they do that and, and, and how we look at that. But they only consume about 3% of the total water. So they're very efficient. And if you think about these big resorts, anything that goes to the bottom line goes into their pocket. So they don't want to be spending a lot of money on expenses, water, energy, things like that. They're looking to be more efficient in how they do things. But they don't want to compromise guest comfort. So Las Vegas, just and I think you guys have seen this, it's about perception. It's what you see and what you think about. And, that, and the Las Vegas, these guys are really good at that, is building your perception of the place. So we have mega resorts here, and that's what I like to call them. These places are huge. And these are, uh, these are the, uh, in the top 10, the Venetian here, the Venetian Palazzo is number two in the world in size with 7,000 room. Um, MGM Grand, I mentioned earlier, third. Win, uh, the Wynn and Encore, fourth, Luxor, that's the Pyramid, um, and Mandalay Bay and the Hotel, that's the sixth. Those are in the top 10 in the world. The number one is uh, in Malaysia, and they have 10,000 rooms. I can't even imagine what that looks like. So these are very, very large buildings. They're, they're small cities, really. And, you know, what you see on top is just a fraction of what's below, where everybody, all the employees go, their lunchrooms, their, all the, you know, plant facilities and everything else. It, it, it's unbelievable. Caesar's Palace is a good example. That place, um, one of my, myself and one of my colleagues, 
we got lost in there for about a half an hour because the guy goes, just go down the hall and turn left and then go straight. You know, well, we went down the hall for about 20 minutes, turned left, and then went straight for another 15 minutes. You know, I was like, okay, we need to make a call. It's getting scary. You know, so uh, they, they, these things are, they're, they're very large. So, and I mentioned perception. So here's Caesar Palace. And you're driving a by on the strip, and this is what you see. And you might be going down the strip 20 miles an hour, something like that. That's what you see. And what do you think? Wow, that's a lush-looking place. Well, they don't want you in the fountain. They don't want you on the landscaping. They want you indoors, right? So this is, this is Caesar's Palace from the air, right? Here's what you were looking at from the street. It's not very big. It's less than 2% of the whole property. This is the casino area here. All this under here, all this, that's casino. This is the forum shops. Um, they have a convention center area here. But that's all you see. This is what they use. So a mega resort, 3,000 rooms on the average. Um, 110 acres. Less than 2% of that is pools. 4% landscaping, and I'm talking about all the streetscapes and things like that. Uh, Encore Wind is a good example. They used artificial turf in a lot of places. They do have a waterfall, um, but it, around the pools, things like that, it's artificial turf. Uh, they, don't want, they don't want to waste water. They don't want to waste um, resources on, on stuff that people really aren't going to spend time on. Um, 94 percent of the building, it's buildings and surfaces. It's, it's nothing more than that. It's your perception of what that is. The one thing they do is uh, they spend, they consume water cooling the buildings. This is what they do and they lose a lot of water through evaporation of the built, through the cooling tower systems, these big sets. And I'll, I'm going to show you one, the largest one uh, in town just to kind of give you an idea of what they have in these buildings uh, in terms of cooling towers. But 75% of the water that's in these resorts is used indoors and we capture it. It's not consumed. 25% is used to cool the buildings. That's their biggest use of energy or water for us. So, we'll, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir and you guys know a lot about this stuff and, and, and so it's not going to be very technical and um, but they have these open systems, these big, huge cooling tower sets, and a, a lot of scale. You know, th these are the things that they see a lot of. We don't see a lot of corrosion here because of the water. Uh, our water tends to scale before it corrodes something. <laughs> you know, it'll line it with cor our scale before it'll corrode. Um, we've actually, and like I said, I'm going to talk to you about observational things, things we get a lot of visitors that come in and they're companies that want to work with the resorts and they stop at our office first to kind of, they think we're going to do the sign of the cross over and bless their, their product or anything, but we don't do that. We don't, we, we won't recommend a product over another. We won't even tell them where to go. We'll, we'll give them some direction on what organizations to talk to, but um, we don't recommend products. So, and again, if you can imagine these, these big cooling tower sets, and you all know this, they're giant air scrubbers. So they're pulling in all, the last two days the wind's been blowing. I think you can see the dust in the air. Can you imagine these resorts are just scrubbing the air around those resorts? They're pulling in all kinds of junk, and, uh, and it's a mess. So what happens is, you know, loss of heat transfer, equipment failure, and health and safety concerns. And, and certainly maintenance costs go up water and energy use, um, and then their reputation is, is on, uh, on the line. Because if something happens to that cooling system and or a microbial activity or something like that or biological stuff, uh, they could certainly ruin their reputation. Um, and they don't want that. That's, you know, the last thing they want is, yeah, I was just in Las Vegas and oh my God, you know, a whole bunch of people got sick from the cooling, whatever. They, they absolutely do not want that. 
They do not want that. So, so we work with them. So this is just some of the, these are averages. This is kind of the water chemistry. And like I said, they tend to scale before they'll corrode water. And, and um, I'll give you an idea of what, they're, what these guys are looking at in their makeup water. And so what they deal with on a, on a, on a daily basis. And certainly when I mention technologies, and they're not new. They're just more sophisticated than they've been. And some of the solutions that these guys are, are using now, and a lot of it comes from the vendors themselves. They drive our programs. They bring it to these guys. They do have money to do things here. They do have money to try new things, and they will, and they can separate things out. Um, one of the things they don't do, and I, in Mark's presentation, is they don't really sub-meter their cooling towers. We will give them meters to do that, but they don't do it unless we'll give them the meter. And uh, I find that kind of strange. That they, you know, some guys, the really good guys do, and you'll see, yeah. Do you have like a D -dot? Do you Give them credit for that? Well, if they, what we do is in, our, in our incentive program, we'll give them the meters, and they just have to put them in. So we do that, and we give them an incentive, and you'll see what our incentive programs are. And I think they're kind of generous. They used to be more generous, but now with the economy and things, we couldn't be that much, <laughs> we couldn't be too generous. So some of the solutions, and like I said, it's nothing new or anything that you haven't seen. They've just become more sophisticated. So, you know, the, these cooling tower controllers, you know, they're doing multiple towers, multiple sets. Uh, they have multiple boilers they can monitor. They can do lots of things. They can look at water chemistry a little more uh, other than just pH. You know, it's not just a pH meter on an acid injection system. It's, they're looking at pH. They're, you know, they're looking at ORP. They're looking at all kinds of different parts of that water chemistry. And, and and we're starting to see the benefit of that. So um, these systems, you know, some of these guys are, are running one to one and a half cycles, and they're, putting in, they're just putting in a new controller, a more sophisticated controller, and they're getting up to three and a half cycles. And, and that's good for us. And you can imagine on the scale that some of these guys are working at, that's a significant amount of water savings for us and energy, and I'll show you that in a second. So we've done nine controller projects here, and this is the water savings, 233 billion gallons of water, or I'm sorry, 233 million, I'm sorry, I missed a zero there. <laughs> it's late for me too, and I didn't stay up late. But um, that's nine projects, these are non-consumptive water, it's non-consumptive, it's water we captured so the real savings is in moving that water, the energy. That's 1,500,000 one, one, 1, kilowatt hours of energy, annual savings, in just those nine projects alone. And these things, uh, what's, what's nice about them is, you know, they're integrated into their building management systems now. They, they text and email the guys, you know, and... Uh, uh, wherever they are, uh, with an, an alarm went off. And now they can go, either something overdosed, underdosed, something happened, crashed, who knows. But now they, they have these, 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 uh, these texts and things that will that'll let them know what's going on with their systems. And in the past, these guys would just come in on Monday morning and go, uh, what happened? You know, and, or, you know, there's stuff all over the floor or something like that. And not all of them, but, you know, the, the, like I said, they're getting more and more sophisticated, and I think you guys know that. But you can see the impact that they have when they, um, you know, when they, when they use these, these newer, more sophisticated controllers. Uh, drift eliminators, they're getting better, getting way better. And, and a lot of what I'm talking about is maintenance, really, you know, taking care of these systems. And... And I think you guys have a, uh, a lot of influence on that. I would hope so, you know, in terms of uh, when you turn the baby over to the, to the parents, you know, and maintaining the systems and doing things. Um, we did 13 projects, uh, and we'll let them do one of these a year, or one of these, uh, just one, because we don't want to pay for their maintenance and oper operations. But we'll, we'll replace them for them once. 
And we've done 13 of these projects. And you can see the water savings, 34 million. And that's consumptive use water. So that's important to us. That's water that's not going up in the air. And we conserved uh, 220, uh, uh, 220,000 kilowatt hours. So the energy is significant. And just to give you some ideas, the homes that can be powered by the energy savings with those nine controllers, 109 homes you could power for a year here. Um, and they save $97,000. The drift eliminators, um, 16 homes and $14,000. So there's money there. There's money to be saved. And, and, and these guys recognize that fact. They, they know that. In fact, they don't really, the incentives aren't, they're significant. They can be significant depending on what you're doing. But they really don't care. We've had guys, you know, we, we call them up and go, hey, you need to cash that check, that $25,000 check we sent you. Yeah, please cash it or do we need to reissue it? And, oh, yeah, I forgot all about that. They, you know, it's more about the energy savings and water savings. And, and for them, it's, it, the incentives really aren't, they don't care. They don't even want the recognition, you know. Hey, you guys did this. And, um, so th they just want the, the, the bottom line. That's the important thing, their margins going up. So this is the Venetian, the Venetian Hotel. Uh, it's the largest LEED certified building or campus in the world, LEED Silver overall. All right. And just to give you an idea, this is the size. This is where it is. Um, they have a convention center. This is the Sands Expo. This is the Venetian. This is the Palazzo area. You can see there isn't a lot of landscaping, not a lot going on outside. Uh, it's a beautiful building. These guys really, really study sustainability and energy and water. Um, they had shallow groundwater coming up in their parking garage, which is their parking garage is, is under this building. So they took that water and they run it through an RO system and then they use it for makeup water in the cooling towers. They built a room, they have a room in there, and it has every light fixture that's on the property. And they test light bulbs, they test LEDs, whatever, make sure it has the proper lighting and it shows, does what it, they want it to do. You can imagine the GEs of the world coming, knocking on, they're pounding on the door, they want to get in their light lab and work, you know, and show them what they can do. So they have a lot of influence on what goes on uh, around the rest of the area in terms of lighting and water and different things. So they're very influential and um, uh, just because of the way they do things. And they really study sustainability in their buildings. In their, uh, you can imagine in their employee cafeteria, uh, they actually have people that stand there and sort the garbage to make sure, it, you know, nope, that goes there. And it doesn't matter who you are. It could be uh, Sheldon Adelson, the owner, could go through. And if he throws it in the wrong pails, that guy's going to tell him, no, pick it up and put it in the right pail. And um, they don't have any qualms about doing that. You know, they're very serious about what they do. So, like I said before, they have uh, over 7,000 rooms. Their occupancy rate is over 90%. So on any given day, they, they're 90% full throughout the year. And um, they have their expo hall. They have 32,500 tons of cooling in this building. So this is the biggest one I've seen. And I think it's the biggest in town. So. Uh, in terms of cooling, how much, they, how much capacity they have. They actually can produce 14 kilowatts or megawatts of energy, emergency energy. So uh, they have a room full of generators. Um, so they can produce their own power if they'd like to. Um, this is their cooling tower set. This is one side of it. Um, these are some of the chillers. Um, they have 11,000 tons in the Venetian and 21,500 in the Palazzo. And this is kind of how they're broken out and, and where they have them. So, uh, and then their boilers. 
And again, they, are, they have the controllers. They, they actually have one guy. All he does is clean um, drift of, the drift packing. That's all he does. That's his job. He starts on one end, goes around. When he finishes, he starts over again. And I, I don't know if I, I don't know. Well, well, this is their, this is their, these are their cooling tower area and their, their physical plant underneath that. So very well kept, very neat. Um, and these, uh, this is these are their uh, this is their packing. You can see it's just black as black. There isn't hardly anything on there, you know. And he just he makes sure it's clean. But they they monitor that water. Their 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 controller monitors everything. They know what's going on at any given moment. Um, and you can see his water chemistry. Um, and they're running at 4.5 cycles. And just so you know. We don't heat buildings. They don't heat these hotels, really. You know, the, all the machinery and everything that are in these hotels, that, that's generating the heat. They, they might back off on cooling capacity in, this, in the winter, but they don't stop cooling the building. It's, it, these things are running all the time. About 72% of the time, that's what we figure they're running is uh, throughout the years, 72% of the time. So, and these are some of their dosing areas and, and some of the chemicals that they use. And so, you know, I mentioned technology and I mentioned people come to us all the time with different things and, and hey, we have this idea and we're running this and, you know, one guy brought us a, they had a, and I can't even remember how he was going to do this, but he was going to run the silica level up in the, in the, in the water to the point where it was like toothpaste. And he's running an emulsion through there, which in turn was going to line the pipes and protect them. And um, they were going to get 50 and above, 50 cycles and above. And we haven't seen anybody install that yet because these guys, you know, I think that would be a tough pill to swallow if someone came into my office and said, hey, got an idea. You know, we're going to do this and we're going to run 50 cycles. And, the other thing is, all these big cooling towers have air quality permits. And believe it or not, even though they're air scrubbers, they, they're required, we have a PM10 rule um, to meet, and they're all permitted. And really, anything over five, and they're getting close to the, the permit guidelines. So anything, so you're running 50 cycles, some of these guys, yeah, I've got a permit that I, I've got to protect, so, so they do that. Um, but what we've seen is geothermal. We have a couple of schools here in Las Vegas that have geothermal wells. They're running that water down through the ground, and about 50 wells throughout the property, and, and, and then returning it back. Um, hybrid cooling, we had a company from uh, Sweden come in, and uh, they were actually going to move their operation here, and they have a hybrid cooling tower, which is air and water. And it, I was pretty impressed with it, it, it and, and it looked like a very good company. I think at that time, the biggest thing, the biggest unit they built was 200 tons. And so I think they went back to the drawing board, you know, because um, I, I liked the design. I just think it was too small. It wasn't, it, 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 they needed to work on scaling it up. We do see reverse osmosis pretreatment. They're treating the waters and the boilers and things. We have a hospital here that's running ultra pure water for their hospital operations, but they're also running it into their boiler. Then they're using the boiler blowdown as makeup water for their cooling towers. So they're getting creative too. There's, there's a lot of creativity there and, and, and I like that. We, do, we did have a laundry using ozone dis, disinfection on some of their cooling stuff and and, uh, and they put it in, and they called us, and, and they were excited, and then they said, don't come. You know, the whole thing's leaking. It's, you know, it just it wrecked havoc on all their seals and things. So once they figured that out, they got it all up and running, and it works really well. And, and then this is a technology I've seen. Uh, it, there hasn't been one installed here because they didn't want to sell it to anybody. They wanted to, to rent it, really and it's um, hydrodynamic cavitation. 
they speed up the velocity of the water and it just cavitates and blows everything apart and it's uh, chemical free water treatment and I was, I was hoping somebody would put one in so we could see how it works, you know, and see if it works really well and I don't know if any of you guys have seen that but um, I thought it was an interesting concept in, in, in the way that things go. So, um, but like I said, we get to see a lot of different technologies um, come through the door and they, you know, they want to talk to us. For example, um, we had a gentleman the other day that custom built a controller. So he's custom building controllers and one of his controllers is installed in a, um, a mint. We have a, a hyper secret minting operation here in Henderson and I didn't even know it was here and they make uh, pure silver blanks for coins and um, holy cow this place is you know in the boondocks and uh, but they have a little crucible they they have a 45 ton cooling system that cools the building most of the time and and then they use that to cool the crucible as well so he custom built this controller because the water temperatures are you know can get quite high and uh, become a challenge and the pH becomes a challenge and things like that but uh, so we've got to see how that works and and uh, to get into this mint you had to go through a metal detector and then they toured us around it and then you had to go back through the metal detector and you couldn't be left alone and it was quite interesting uh, and I had no idea this place was there. Uh, it was very interesting. So this is, these are our incentive programs and um, we have a menu based side and a performance based side. So the menu based side are technologies that we're familiar with. These are controllers that we've seen over and over again. So we've seen nine controllers I think on our list I think there's three or four that we're very familiar with. We know what the water savings will be. We do have a minimum threshold of 250,000 gallons of water a year annual savings. So they have to meet that minimum threshold. Um, once they do that we'll pay 50% of the real product cost or um, if it's non-consumptive water we'll pay $8 per thousand gallons. If it's consumptive use water we'll pay $25 per thousand gallons. Whichever's less. So the maximum is $50,000. So we've given out checks for $50,000. Before this we had um, the threshold was a half a million gallons but uh, there was no cap on the incentive. So we've given out, we had a uh, power plant out in Boulder City that put in a hybrid cooling tower and, um, and did, did their own controller and things. We gave them a, a check for a half a million dollars. So um, at that time, but now it's $50,000 is the max. The performance is custom technology. So if it's something that we've never seen before, we'll, we'll put in meters, we'll, we'll monitor it, we'll make sure it gets the water savings, at least the minimum, and then we'll issue an incentive based on that. And so that, that, that really gets in, brings in these new wild ideas, you know, and if some of these property facility managers uh, want to go for it, they'll, they, you know, they have a little, uh, a little safety net with us. If there is some water savings, we'll pay for it. And, you know, um, and that's the other thing. I, I do want to mention the facility managers here. They're, th it's a very strong professional group and they, they kind of watch out after each other. They help each other. They talk. Um, but there are some of the old timers, you know, the old guys that, yeah, yeah, I know what that does. And you know what? Turn it three times to the left and kick it and it's going to be fine. And, and there are guys that do that, you know, and, and um, you'll see they move around a lot. And what will happen is one guy will put in something and he's comfortable with it, he's familiar with it, he knows how it works. And then the next guy, he'll move on and the next guy comes in and goes, oh man, we got to change that. I, what is that? And they start taking things out. And they, you know, switch it all up. So they get comfortable with what they're doing. And, and, and that's a challenge. It can be a challenge because things were working really well. And then the new guy comes in and he, it's something he's never seen, you know, it's a, it's a red piece of equipment and I'm used to the black one and so let's go get the black one. And because they have a lot of money, they go get the black one, 
you know, and uh, so there is a challenge there. But we do require that they keep some of this, they keep this new equipment in for 10 years unless there's an improvement in the technology. Well, and they, if there's an improvement in technology the next year and they want to put it in, we'll help pay for it. So th that's how committed we are. And, and, and that, like I said, that's a good group of guys. They, uh, they're always looking for ways to improve things. So since the program started, the Water Efficient Technologies Program, we've, overall we've done 141 projects. And it's 6 billion gallons, 6.5 billion gallons of water saved. And we've paid out over $2 million. Uh, the resorts, and they've not only done cooling tower projects, they've done uh, high efficiency toilets, shower heads, uh, belt flight type dishwashers in their ballroom operations. You can imagine they, these guys can run a few dishes through the ballrooms. Uh, so they've done things like that. Uh, they, they used to have, some of these places had laundry facilities. They, now it's all through a couple of large commercial laundry facilities. Brady Industries, one. They use a pulse washer. You guys have heard of those? The, the water runs the opposite direction of the, the laundry. Um, they used to, a typical tunnel washer was using about three gallons per load per pill of about 150 pounds of laundry. These things um, use a little bit less than a gallon. And what happens is they drop 150 pounds of laundry in this thing every 90 seconds and it moves from chamber to chamber. Um, the water from the from the end, the rinse water comes up and it starts the pre-rinse and it just moves it's moving opposite the laundry and it's very efficient and they're dropping a pill out of these things every 90 seconds and uh, it's amazing what they do. Uh, I went through their laundry, you know, they're doing all the sheets in town and they, they, they don't even dry them, they just, they run them through a, a folder and they're dry. You know, this thing is, it's amazing. I, I, so, but the, the, the resorts don't have the laundries. They do it commercially. They, they contract it out. There are some high-end laundries that do uh, high-end stuff like the, the, all the penthouses and they have the, you know, the Egyptian cotton 5,000 thread sheets or whatever they are. I don't know what they are, you know, but they have to be dealt with with some kit gloves and, and, um, and he's very secretive about what he uses but he, uh, he's done some projects with us in terms of, you know, he uses some uh, ozone and different things in his processes, but, uh, um, you know, he'd kill you if you <laughs> if you saw something you weren't supposed to see in his laundry. He's, he's quite the guy. But, um, but it, it's been a very successful uh, relationship with the resorts here, and like I said, they're, they, they deal on a scale that, you don't normally get to see in other places. We had the Cooling Tower Institute. Uh, one of my uh, technicians called and was just asking a simple question, and the guy says, well, what, do you, wh what are we talking about in terms of, you know, size and tonnage? And, and he goes, well, the, the one where I'm looking at is about 5,000 tons. And he goes, what? You know, he was surprised. And, and, and he goes, well, you know, this is Las Vegas, and it's a big building, and, and so... Um, they just don't get to see the scale that they, they have in other places, um, and it's, it's kind of fun. But the Venetian, if you get a chance, if you um, uh, take a look at it, it it's, a, it's a great facility, it's a great building. Um, they're very open to wanting to show you what they do and, and how they do it. It's, uh, it's very impressive. So, All right, everybody ready to go out now? and. Enjoy the, yes, sir. What are your water and sewer rates around here compared to the rest of the world? You know what? Our water rates aren't that bad. And I, I can tell you, um, you know, we have a, a four-tiered water rate structure. Um, and it starts out at a at dollar five per thousand. And it'll go up to four dollars per thousand. And, and you might think that's obscenely low compared to some other places. And we get compared to Tucson and things. But you have to remember, Las Vegas was the fastest growing city for the last 20 years. Our infrastructure's nearly brand new. You know, all of our, we're not paying, 
like Philadelphia is, and some of these older cities, Baltimore, I think, is, they're paying to replace infrastructure and piping and things. And that's done through water rates. So um, we have a fairly new system, fairly sophisticated and, and, and a, a great asset manager. And, and so our water rates are just, they're high by our standards. We just raised them. <laughs> but, no, they're not. But, but again, you have older infrastructures and different things that you, ours is pretty much brand new. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that you talk about, which you're doing, like uh, going further up north in the state, mm -hmm. you do some spring mining up in there for water. What about water uh, reclamation, like Orange County? Are you familiar with Orange County's water? Is it a water pump? No, yeah, I'm not. They get it from recycling and urine. Okay, so a toilet, I'm going to just say it, a toilet to tap type of, we actually, if you think about it, we are doing direct reuse. That's direct reuse. So any, any water we capture and use indoors, and I'm not going to exclude the toilet, we capture it, clean it, we put it through the Las Vegas wash, it goes back into Lake Mead and we draw it out again. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what says Orange County, they're doing yeah. that now, a lot of people. It is gross. It sounds gross, but I, you know, if you if you follow the technology, you, you're they do test on it. And they claim it's much cleaner than some of the traditional water plants. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And we we use ozone disinfection when in, in the process when it comes out of the lake. Um, but yeah, it, it gets cleaned when it goes into the wash. It gets polished, and then it gets drawn out and cleaned again. So yeah, it's very clean. And so you guys you guys are doing that. Yes, we are doing, and, and we, it's direct reuse. Yes, we are. Yes, sir. Any outages ever? In our system? No, actually, we haven't had anything like that at all. Um, you, you notice the lake level, we have two intakes right now. So one is about 50 feet from being exposed, and we got within eight feet of it being exposed. We have a second intake below that one. We're currently putting in a third intake this is the most, and, and I wish I could show you slides, but it's the most complicated tunneling project in the world. And we're actually tunneling under Lake Mead with a tunnel boring machine. Um, it's about halfway done. The intake structure is actually on the bottom of the lake right now. So um, below, below where it, the lake would be classified as dead pool. So we're going to draw water at um, 800 feet below the surface, so, uh, you know, or elevation 800 below. So, um, and it sticks up about 100 feet off the bottom of the lake, and then our tunnel boring machine will bore into that. And uh, uh, I went down there, they, we dug a, we mined out a 30-foot a shaft to go down, because we had to build an assembly chamber and that, at 600 feet. So we go down in this elevator, <laughs> the crane elevator, and, um, you'd be amazed at the amount of water that's seeping out through those rocks. And it's all warm, it's hot water. Um, we pump it out, we clean it, and we put that back in Lake Mead. And that water's seeping out at about 3,500 gallons a minute. And uh, it's quite an operation. The, the tunnel boring machine is, is um, 600 feet long. It can be pressurized like a submarine, the, the business end of it. Uh, so if they run into conditions where they need to seal themselves in. They can be pressurized. There's a decompression chamber. It has its own little rail cars. It lines the tunnel as it, as it bores through there. Um, so it's pretty impressive. No auditors, no more boring coming out. No, no, and we, we're, any water we conserve, so for example, if we don't use our allotment for the year, and the last uh, last six or seven years, we've had about 25,000 acre feet left over. We put it into ground, we, we pump it into uh, wells, or we store it, or we bank it in California or Arizona. We, in other words, we give them water, and then they, on paper, they, we bank water. So, um, yes, sir? Last question. I was just curious, uh, with your department, do you have procedures dealing with have the Nevada, the nuclear tests, and there's, uh, I guess, some company that had an arrangement, some mountain over here, they would take nuclear waste from the power plants. 
Yeah. Do you deal with them? Have you ever is that is that a consideration you guys had to deal with in looking where you're drawing the water? Or? No, no, we 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 haven't. Yucca Mountain, they've basically shut down that operation. They haven't stored anything there. Um, it it uh, became kind of controversial, and uh, it was shut down. And Congress didn't renew any of their budgets. Uh, uh, they weren't approved, so it hasn't been operational. How far down were they dumping the uh, waste? You know what, I, I'm not sure how far in they went and how deep, um, but it's about 90 miles from here, Yucca Mountain is, so. It's close to Area 51, and there is an Area 51. <laughs> yes, sir. I see Mexico on the list of the users, and they get zero. Are they yeah, they get 1.5 million acre feet of water. They, they're required to deliver it. So it comes through a channel, a canal through California, the All-American Canal, and it comes through there. Uh, there was some controversial issues with California and um, Mexico. Uh, the All-American Canal runs right along the border, and it wasn't lined, and it was leaking. And so s the Mexican farmers, you know, they're, hey, look at this, water. It's like having a hole in your pocket, you know, you're dropping change. Well, California started lining the canal, and Mexico sued California. You know, it's like, well, we're just sewing up the hole in our pocket. That's all. And so, um, yeah, so the, there, there are issues with managing the river, and, and all seven states in Mexico do manage the river. For example, um, Mexico had a, 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 an earthquake not this recent one, but it was a couple of years ago. And it, and it damaged a lot of their infrastructure and their ability to take their water. Uh, so we allowed them, you know, the Colorado River guys allowed them to store their water in Lake Mead, which helped everybody. It helps us. It brought the level back up and, and different things. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, lake level, is it stabilized? Well, you know, if you talk to somebody in California, they're going, it's going to rain. Don't worry about it. But the, the river, we know the lake level is going to fluctuate because uh, this is the growing season in the Imperial Valley. So they, they get their water. They call their water. Uh, one of the things that we've done, we built a $40 million reservoir in California. We paid for it. Because when the Imperial Valley orders water, it takes three days to get there. And now it could rain. And if it rains, those guys in the Imperial Valley, yeah, we don't need it. Let it go. Don't even, don't even open the valve. Let it go. And it doesn't count against them. So we said, hey, we'll build a reservoir, impound that water, and then, you know, give us part of it. So we get part of that water. There's a lot of give and take on the river, and there has to be because it is so, it's over appropriated and, and it's in trouble. But they're doing a lot of conservation things throughout the whole basin, you know, removing tamarisk trees along the banks, uh, cottonwoods, different things that just suck water uh, just out of the system, system loss, yeah. Um, are most everyone who's drawing from the Colorado River with the non-suck water, are they returning to the Colorado River? Or is the basin? In other words, does it make its way back to some of it does, not all of it does, but we do because of where we are. But if you, you know, like um, in the Imperial Valley, uh, and, and these farmers in, in the West, it's first in line, first in right. That's, that's the law of the river. Um, and so the Imperial Valley farmers were really the guys, the first ones in line, right? So they're using water, and they don't have to, they don't use drip irrigation. They don't use high-efficiency irrigation techniques. They flood irrigate. And if you look at a picture of the Imperial Valley, it's just one big green flat carpet. But if, if they were using um, precision irrigation and drip irrigation and different things, they could back off on a lot of their water use. But you know what? They don't have to. And they'll tell you that. We don't have to because we're the first ones in line. But I think they're going to be pushed into that. They're being pushed into that. They're, being, they're giving them incentives and things to do that. So 
there's a lot of things to be worked out. We know that, but um, we'd certainly like anything that we can get back into the river, restoring the stream flows. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of things that were done to the river and uh, in different areas that, that feed the Colorado River, and now they're putting them back into the channels, which helps. You know, Trout Unlimited is very big uh, on restoring stream flows. We've done it. We have a we have a, a natural area that. <laughs> This natural area has a spring. It's the warm springs. And the water's warm. It, and there's a little fish about this big. It's about the size of a sardine. There's only, um, there's only 1,700 of these fish in the world. It's the Moapidase. And guess what? They only live in about 50 feet of that stream. Well, back in the day, when this was an active farm, they destroyed the stream flow. They took it out of its channel. They were just letting it sheet across the land to water, irrigate. We've gone in and we've restored that stream, given, it, given that 50 feet. And when we started, there were only 300 of the Moapidase. Now there's 1,700. So things like that help. Putting things back where they belong or where they were help overall because that goes right back into the Colorado River, all that stuff, instead of just evaporating over this. Over the, so restoring stream flows doing some environmental projects, things like that. Plus, it helped with fish. I, you know, I'm from Colorado. I grew up in Colorado, but Nevada has some pretty persnickety little wildlife. You know, we, we've got one fish that only lives in, in about three feet of water in depth in a cave, in this one cave. <laughs> and there's only, there's only about 120 of them, and they're about that big. And it's a devil hole pup fish. It's the most protected fish on earth. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful fish. It's about that color blue. But there's, there, there aren't many of them. There's only two people that can actually get in the water with these darn things to count them, and they count them twice a year. They've got them all named. You know, there's, it, it, I, it, I just can't imagine, but it, it, uh, it's interesting, some of this stuff in, uh, we do. So. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.